Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Temple University. Uh, this is a great uh, hall that we uh, uh, recently uh, renovated, and uh, so pleased to have uh, TEDx Philly here at uh, Temple University. So um, I'm going to talk about City as a computing platform. Uh, we are living in an uh, exciting time, exciting historic uh, time, uh, where we can use technology to uh, transform the world, uh, enhancing the quality of lives, and giving hopes to those who desperately need hope in their lives. Um, this is my dog uh, who is looking for some uh, treat, very excited. Uh, I think we have uh, at least three reasons to be very excited. Uh, first, uh, for the first time, information technology is no longer the primary obstacle for human imagination. For a long time since the invention of computers, our imagination ran ahead of technology. And so uh, we kind of did what we could do. So I call that the logical feasibility. Uh, in mid-1990s, I did some project on distance learning. Back then, we called it distance learning. Now we have a more fancy name, e-learning and virtual learning. Uh, we tried to connect two classrooms a uh, few thousand miles apart with two ISDN lines and two 28.8K modems. And it wasn't very pretty. It was clunky, clumsy, and it barely worked. Uh, but we did it because we believed in that the future uh, we can uh, have a really great uh, learning opportunity. We can transform how we teach kids. So we just wanted to demonstrate what we might be able to do in the future. But now, this is reality. Uh, technology worked like magic. They cut up our imagination, so they no longer really became, uh, is the obstacle for our human imagination. So that's the uh, first reason uh, for us to get excited. The second reason is that uh, first time uh, since the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, anyone who has $300 to buy a laptop and access to the broadband can pursue their own ideas and dreams and become an entrepreneur. This is very, very significant. In the industrial economy, we needed physical machines to produce uh, same products, making cheaper, faster, and better. And in order to do that, we needed a lot of money. And because of that, there was a separation between those who produced and those who only consumed. And we call it professional society. Now we are in, living in what we call post-professional society. Anyone who has an idea and have access to $300 can become their own entrepreneur. This is second reason that we can be excited about. The third reason is that we are seeing a whole new generation of people who, are, who have graduated and entering the workforces. And these are the people who have, for the first time in human uh, history, who lived their entire life without a single moment without having computers in their lives. This is very, very significant. We call them digital natives. They're born into the world of digital world. So this is a Roblox website. Some of you may know. It's an open source community for kids. This is where my uh, ten, uh, the son who's 10th grade learned an entire programming language. He never uh, took a class. He never went to uh, a college. Uh, he uh, never read any single book. He just learned all from by copying other people's uh, code and kind of tried to improve them. Why did he do it? Because he thought it was fun. That's how they do it. Now, many of us in this room are digital immigrants. We were born into the world where a computer was not, and then we slowly migrated into the world of computers. Now, I am an immigrant myself, and I know a little bit about being an immigrant. It has to do with language. Immigrants learn their own language, and then they have to learn new language for their work. So English is my work language. And then over time, I had to learn how to speak uh, English for my life, right? So when I go to restaurant, that is very hard. You know, when I first came here, I didn't know how to order food because I never learned how to order food in English. I learned how to speak my, uh, 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 my uh, professional uh, contents in English, but I never learned how to express myself, what I want to eat. So that was a big deal, right? But the, uh, the natives are different. They learn their life language, and then they just use it for their work. Now, when you apply this idea for digital natives and digital immigrants, you can understand why our kids spend 24-7 online, because it is their life. 
It is how they speak. And then when they grow up, they just use that same language that they learn how to play with their kids, uh, friends, and then they just use it for their work. When we go uh, home after the work, we turn off the computers, and then we don't use computers. So we think it is really, really strange when we see our kids online all the times. And the, the thing is that they are digital natives, and it is their life language. So this is, a, now, if you think about it, what will happen for these kids who are born into the world where we have a smartphone in their pocket? They grew up expecting that Google Maps is in their pocket, right? They can speak to the phone and the phone will uh, uh, give them uh, the weather forecast for today. Uh, they try to manipulate magazines on an I uh, iPad. When they enter the workforces, what kind of imagination that they would have inventing new world? So this is the third reason that we can be excited about. So these are the three factors that makes this particular moment in history exciting time to live. Uh, it creates unbounded, generative, and distributed digital innovations that we are seeing today in the world. So the question is, what are we going to do with this uh, potentially incredibly powerful technology and all these social forces? Are we going to continue to create new games in which we throw these angry birds to these houses that the pigs uh, uh, built? <laughs> Right? Or are we going to do something more meaningful by trying to solve intractable, complex problems that the society, the world, whole world is facing? So my proposal to you today is let's reimagine cities by applying this incredible new technology that we are seeing today. Why cities? Because it matters, right? More than 50% of world population now lives in cities. And cities are most exciting, complex, most amazing, compelling human-made objects. If you look at it from the, look down on Earth from the satellite, you see clouds, you see ocean, you see big mountains, and then you see cities. You do not see roads, you do not see cars, you do not see houses, you do not see iPhone. What you see, what you see is cities. City represents human civilization. This is most exciting, compelling man-made objects, and we have a lot of work to do to make it better. City is where we do production. City is the center of finance. City is the center of transportation. City is where media is made. City is where consumption is done. City is the center of culture. But yet, city also attracts problems. We have poverty, we have traffic, we have population problem, we have housing issues, we have education problems. So the question is, how can we use this digital technology to transform our cities? So my pro and by using generative, unbounded, and distributed digital innovations in the city. So my proposal to you today is let's think of city as a computing platform. In fact, when you look around the city, there are many digital sensors. We have actuators that are controlled by computers. We have networks around the city. We have a lot of databases about cities. We have cars equipped with digital technology. In fact, a lot of cars, actually the, more than 50% of the cost comes from digital technology and software. Buildings have a lot of uh, digital technology embedded. We have signs that read uh, what's happening around them and, and transmitting that information who, know, uh, who knows where. And then we have people carrying all sorts of technology. I have iPhone and a Blackberry, and then I carry uh, my MacBook Air all the time. And then when I travel, I have a Kindle, sometimes I carry my iPad, right? And then in my car, I have another GPS. We, you know, we're surrounded with computers all the time. Eight megabits per second. This is the uh, internal bus communication bandwidth of Apple II when it was first introduced. Now, 54 megabits per second. This is our current Wi-Fi speed. And then 24 megabits per second. This is your know, latest Bluetooth speed. The point that I'm trying to make is that the communication speed between computers now actually exceeds the communication bandwidth that we had 20 years ago inside the computer. So what does that tell us? But that, that, that tells us that we should actually think about city as a computer, not as a metaphor, but actually a computer system, right? So we are, in fact, whether you like it or not, a part of a big computer system, right? As you move, as you use your computers, you are creating data, and we can actually harness it and use it for good purpose. So the good news is that we already have lots of these things in place. This is a map uh, of Denver downtown. These are uh, dots are uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points, 
Right? This is a screen capture that I did in, when I was in Helsinki. Look at all the Wi-Fi access points that I have. Right? We build smart homes. We are creating smart grid. This is a media tower downtown Seoul. People can interact with it. They can search. They can do play uh, contents, and then they, could, uh, they can do a lot of different things. This is a picture I took uh, in Shinjuku, Japan, Tokyo. And you can use this to order food, and you can look up uh, a menu. This is before iPad. This is a computer in a uh, train, and a lot of times we have uh, many, many computers in, in, uh, in airplanes. Uh, you know, I took a picture of this at the Philadelphia airport. I didn't know, actually, they were running back. <laughs> you know, we have, um, we have computers in cars. And many cities actually have complete digital mapping of underground pipes. And many of these pipes actually now have digital tags. This is a, a screen capture from uh, Frank Gehry's office. And um, they build buildings, entire building in a digital model. And these digital models act actually leave long after the project is uh, completed. And they become the basis of creating smart buildings. This is RFID tag that I took out of a book that I bought in Japan. Right? And then we are so increasingly surrounded by this kind of like a QR code. So bad news is, however, they are mostly closed, the systems. They are disconnected, and they are proprietary. So they are not generative, and they are not participatory, and they are built, they are built on industrial logic. So what are we going to do about it, right? How can we convert our city as really a computing platform uh, instead of building on other apps? Uh, what we need is a set of APIs and SDK. And we need to create data and services and open them up to the public so that they can build their own applications. What we need also is a granular service component, invisible layer of uh, digital uh, services that can interact with uh, physical space. Uh, and, and they sit on top of physical infrastructure that we see. And then we equipped local areas with low-powered, inexpensive sensor network so that they can collect data and then uh, send them back to the databases. And those data will become available for developers to build new apps. So when you think about cities, now you need to think about not just urban uh, landscaping uh, architecture or urban planning, but we also need to think about urban information architecture. We need people who deliberately think about what type of information we need to collect, how are we going to store them, and how are we going to use them, who's going to have access to them, who's responsible for, those in, uh, for that information. And the city as a, a platform needs to be uh, perfectly incompletely designed. Incompleteness is important because you need to invite people to solve the problem. And we need to have a generative design rules in the sense that the design rules allow people to open up new spaces that the original inventor never thought about. So how, one thing that we learned from open innovation that we can apply to urban innovation is that the people who face problems on a daily basis are the ones who are likely to have insights to solve the problem. So how can we connect those, those people who live with problems help them to advertise their problems, and then connect them with resources so that they can solve their own problems. We equip those uh, uh, local uh, community residents so that they can invent their own problems, uh, uh, solve their own problems, and then uh, create new products that they can sell into the world. In order to do this, we need to mobilize all available resources, and this is a social solutions that will be technically implemented. Let me conclude with one thought to you, that is that Every generation faces its own generational challenge. And it is response to their uh, existential threat. The previous generation had Cold War. This generation has a cities as their gener uh, generational challenge. It embodies all the major problems, poverty, sustainability, health, and education. And this is a global problem with intimate local uh, context. So every city can have its own design studio, creating vibrant apps ecology. So the vision of a digital city is to build generative platform for this digital innovation, to create humanly satisfying, environmentally responsible, economically sustainable, technologically feasible solutions. In order to do this, we need to bring professionals and non-professionals together. We need to bring government and citizens together. We need to bring universities and businesses together to invent, design, 
and discover and commercialize solutions. So this is the uh, vision of Digital City. Now we have started this thing called Urban Apps and Map Studio here at Temple to start this movement initiative here in North Philadelphia. So wait and see, come back to us about two years later and see what happened here in North Philadelphia. Thank you.